The Smith House, with its creaky wooden floors and faded portraits, feels like a turn-of-the-century museum, isolated from the modern world outside. Its rooms are filled with pamphlets and books on water conservation, land use, and historic preservation. Further back in a corner past the kitchen, there is a door with a sign that reads, Venomous Animal in Room. Proceed with caution. And behind that seemingly out-of-place warning is Matt Good. A research scientist with the University of Arizona's School of Natural Resources and the Environment, Good has worked for several years on a project that aims to create a baseline of understanding for the world's largest venomous snake, the mysterious King Cobra. Together with a team of scientists and volunteers, he has been tracking the snakes throughout the soggy Agombe rainforest of India's Western Ghats since 2007. Uh, the project started when a colleague in, in India, a guy named Ron Whitaker, a very well-known Indian herpetologist, got a hold of me uh, because he'd known some of my work previously, uh, mostly on radio telemetry stuff with other snake species. And he'd read some of my papers or whatever. And, he asked me if I would come over there and get involved with that. And I said, yeah, sure, you know, sign me up. And... Although the King Cobra's numbers are not severely threatened, India's expanding population is encroaching on their habitat. Forest fragmentation due primarily to local agriculture of rice and beetle nut has caused many snakes to find their way into local homes. Gauri Shankar, a local snake rescuer who works with Good, has personally caught over a hundred snakes. But the practice of catching and releasing cobras, sometimes up to 40 kilometers away, can have a negative effect on the species. They'll show aberrant movement patterns. They'll try to find their way back to their original home range. They know exactly where their home ranges are, and they use those home ranges just like you and I know where the grocery store is. You know, they know they know that kind of thing. And if you move them too far, it messes them up really bad. Uh, they'll they'll often quit feeding. Uh, they'll go on straight line movements in search of you know air territory that they know. To address the problem, Good, Whitaker, and the team at the Agumbe Rainforest Research Station are looking to present the king cobra as the face of a large wildlife reserve. And that's a, that's a model that you see around the world. You have like uh, preserves which are uh, dedicated for lions and tigers and rhinos, and you know those are all big charismatic mammals. And king cobras, we think, are big and charismatic snakes, and so we're hoping to sort of you know, use them as, the, the, again, the flagship species for preserving large tracts of forest. The snake does make for a captivating mascot. Its scientific name literally translates to snake eater, and for good reason. A 12 to 13 foot long king cobra has few qualms about making a meal of its relatives. One male we documented actually visually saw it eat 26 pit vipers over a two month period. But what has really captivated Good's interest was the king cobra's willingness to eat other king cobras. And, in, and we've had two instances already of uh, male king cobras eating females, and they were courting those females. Both females had already been courted by other males. One of, one of them we knew was grabbed, in other words, it had eggs, and he actually ate her. This is a practice that has been seldom recorded, and they have several different explanations. Good explains that it doesn't make much sense for a male snake to eat a potential mate. However, if the female is carrying the eggs of another male, eating her may serve as a method of eliminating his competitor's offspring. Then again, maybe he was just hungry. With so few examples and little data, it is difficult to be sure. It is clear, however, that being able to document these incidents at all is a testament to the methods the team has employed and to the hardiness of the trackers. Using radio telemetry, they are able to keep a log of the snake's movements, but first the animal must be caught, a hazardous undertaking considering that the king cobra packs enough neurotoxin to kill a grown man with a single bite. Next, the snake is sedated and a small transmitting device is implanted in its body. Good has been doing this sterile surgical procedure since the early 1980s. But all this is only the beginning. The transmitter sends a signal to a handheld receiver that a student volunteer, wildlife biologist, and local forest guide used to sweep the jungle as if it were a minefield. But finding a person willing to slog through the agumbe all day, every day, isn't easy, and most volunteers don't last. Again, it rains 8 to 10 meters per year there. And within literally minutes, you'll, you'll have about 15 or 20 leeches on you. And, you know... You get really bad if you don't take good care of your uh, feet and stuff. You get really nasty jungle rot. Only certain people are able to do that, and that's, that's field biologists for you. They're, they're a rare breed. So far, the team has implanted transmitters in five snakes. One female was eaten immediately by a male, another was killed by a mongoose, and the transmitter on a third failed prematurely. 
That leaves two snakes that are still active in the project, a number that Good says will not get much higher due to regulations enforced by the Indian government. Their perspective on wildlife is a lot different than ours is. Um, king cobras, for example, are worshipped as gods, especially in the area where we're at. The Indian government has been keeping a close watch on the project and even threatened to stop the work after footage of a male king cobra eating a female was aired in a National Geographic documentary. What we're running into are some cultural differences that we have to be very sensitive about and that we, we do respect very much, but sometimes we just have to sort of work through it. The importance of the work does seem to transcend the cultural boundary, and the team continues to strive for a wildlife preserve. However, the needs of the surrounding population must be taken into consideration, and a preserve in India will not necessarily resemble one in the United States. Even when we do get a preserve established, I don't think it will be the same as like a national park here where nobody can go in there anymore. I think it will still continue to be very multiple use and that kind of thing. In the meantime, Good continues to cross the creaky wooden floors to his office at the back of the Smith House in Tucson. He trained an Indian veterinarian to implant the transmitters so the project can move forward without him having to go halfway around the world. From his outpost, he works to secure grants from places like Saudi Arabia, Hong Kong, and the Disney Worldwide Conservation Fund, supplying the project with money crucial to its success. It all sheds a little light on one of the world's most intriguing, deadly, and mysterious inhabitants. That is the primary thing that we're doing, is what's it like to be a king cobra? And Without that first step, then we're not going to be able to do all the other things we want to do, uh, including having an understanding of how they're using the environment and, you know, things which are going to be more from a conservation perspective. We first have to understand the beast.